Volume Four, Chapter Twelve of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith, Volume Four, Chapter Twelve while these things passed at rochemart celestina no longer doubting of willoughby's marriage and entire desertion of her was trying to acquire more than calm resignation which she had so often determined to adopt and so often lost montague thoroughgood accompanied by lady horatia to chettenham where as celestina foresaw his ardent entreaties and the wishes of her friend so strongly enforcing them gave her so much pain that she grew hourly more fond of the scheme she had adopted of travelling if she found it difficult to evade the inopportunities of her lover and her benefactress she dreaded yet more the arrival of the elder mr thoroughgood who about six weeks after montague's recovery came with him after a short visit he had paid at home to chetham he soon found an opportunity of speaking to celestina alone and then she became more than ever consciousness of the influence that his solid understanding his excellent principles and his tender regard for her gave him over her ingenious mind though he never complained she knew well that he was not happy in the other branches of his family and that his hopes were particularly fixed on his younger son whose attachment to celestina which had it been successful might have secured in one point the felicity of his father had hitherto produced for him only anxiety and solicitude he had seen his life once more in imminent hazard from the fierce and impetuous vassiver and from his own rashness which he could not but condemn he had seen for many months all his talents and almost all his affections lost and absorbed in this one predominant passion and he knew not what the effect might be on his intellects and on his health should he finally be refused yet while willoughby was uncertain as to his own situation or unmarried the elder mr thoroughgood had been withheld from making any efforts with celestina on behalf of his son now those impediments were removed he no longer thought himself restrained from applying to her himself so mildly and rashly however he entered on this conversation that celestina retained more courage while she heard him that she at his commencement had dared to expect and when he had recapitulated all the advantages which might he thought be derived from her union with a man so passionately devoted to her of suitable age of easy fortune one whose taste was congenial to her own whose temper was remarkably good and who had a heart uncorrupted by vice and exhausted by a long course of intrigue and a family who would consider her admission into it as the greatest blessing that they could receive celestina acknowledged it was all very true i own too sir said she that to many people and perhaps to you i may have appeared to give your son such encouragement as never ought to be given unless it is meant to end in marriage i have felt without having it in my power to avoid impropriety yet it will do me the justice to say i have always told him that whatever were my sentiments in his favour and however i wish to encourage those sentiments because i was persuaded he deserved them yet that my heart never felt for him that decided preference without which i cannot believe he could be happy were i to give him my hand i was too sure that from an unfortunate prepossession 
in favour of another it never could feel this preference and that therefore though i should always be happy to be considered as his friend i never would be his wife allow me dear sir to repeat to you a resolution from which i do not believe i shall ever recede you know how true love and veneration i have for you there is not on earth a man whom i so soon choose to supply to me that sacred and tender relationship i have never known and to call by the endearing name of father but i cannot indeed i cannot marry i know not why but some invincible persuasion hangs over me that if i do i shall be miserable and render my husband miserable whatever may be his merit or affection and can i ought i under such conviction to wish it be assured that if time and reason conquer this weakness for perhaps it may be only weakness if ever i feel that i can give your son a heart weaned from every other attachment and worthy of his i will say so as candidly as i declare the impossibility of me doing so now and you are so liberal that you will forgive my weakness and save me i am sure from importunity which is the more distressing as it comes from those i so much esteem and whose wishes it would be on any other subject my pride and my pleasure obey mr thorogood after this conversation and some other of the same nature was convinced that celestina acted from motives of the most delicate honour the more he saw of her heart and disposition the more fondly he became attached to her and the more ardently desired that she might become the wife of his son he saw that through her ideas were what would be generally called romantic they were not cherished merely because they were so but that of a high sense of tender duty she wished to pay to the man with whom she was to pass her life made it impossible for her to enter into such engagements till she was sure of fulfilling them according to her own ideas and he hoped that her entire separation from willoughby his unkindness and neglect on one hand and on the other the acknowledged merit of his son would though almost insensibly yet not slowly produce that change which she allowed herself to be possible though at present it did not seem probable in this hope he was contented to rest and promising celestina that if she would still allow montague to see her frequently he should not tease her by importunity he threw himself entirely on her generosity and sincerity and after a visit of nearly a week he left montague at chapman by the desire of lady horatia and returned home in a few days after his departure celestina had another and more painful scene to encounter cathcart arrived early one morning and eagerly asked to speak to her she went down to him immediately but when she saw him she dared not ask the purpose of a visit so little expected he was pale he trembled and hesitated he looked fatigued and dejected willoughby instantly recurred to her for he was always the first object of her thoughts is anything the matter dear cathcart she said with willoughby oh no replied he nothing new i have not heard of him since he went which i think strange celestina sighed and though she was able too well to account for it but is jessie well yes thank heaven replied he but my sister what miss elphinstone no my other my unfortunate sister emily i have been sent for her at bristol where you know i went to her some time since at your entreaty she has now i think only a few days to live my sister elphinstone is with her poor emily wishes to see you i know not how to ask such a favour of you but you are so good will you 
can you oblige a family who is already owe to you all the happiness they possess what will i not do to give any part of its satisfaction said celestina but do you can you guess the reason of your sister's wishes to see me surely vassiver is not there he was not when i left her but a few days before he had been at bristol raving like a madman at the fatal intelligence he had then had confirmed that emily could not live if however he should come you can have nothing to fear for i will not leave you a moment and i know you so well that i am persuaded there are few disagreeable circumstances which would not to you be compensated by the reflection of having given comfort to the last moments of my dying emily this plea celestina could not resist she went therefore by the consent of lady horotia with cathcart to bristol where a scene awaited her that for some time almost suspended even her thoughts of willoughby himself this lovely unhappy victim to early seduction was in the last stage of consumption and unlike those who are cut off by that distemper was perfectly aware and perfectly reconciled to her fate her earnest wishes had been to be forgiven by cathcart and to die in the arms of her sister they both now attended her with the tenderest affection and had even yielded to her request to be allowed to see vassiver towards whom all her anxiety was now turned and for his happiness she felt that concern which she no longer was sensible of for herself her exhausted heart was from gratitude and habit attached to vassiver and she saw that her death would take away the only tie that had been some restraint on his ungovernable lightiousness that his disappointment in regard to celestina had embittered his temper and given him a sort of excuse for the liberalism in which he seemed to resolute to persevere and while his good qualities his generosity and his candour as well as his attentive tenderness towards her had made her affection for him the last sentiment she was capable of feeling she fancied it yet possible young as she was celestina might be induced to save a man who appeared so well worth the attempt and that interesting as he appeared to her he could not fail of having some interest with others and particularly with one who had learned from willoughby an early prejudice in his favour which he hoped all his subsequent rashness had not yet wholly destroyed such were the views of emily cathcart in requesting this visit and her beautiful eyes lit up with the fire that was consuming her became yet more dazzling bright when her lovely visitor was led into the room by her brother celestina entered trembling and fearing the sight of vassiver whom she had never met since the terrifying night at ranla but the moment she beheld emily she no longer thought of anything but the affecting object before her emily sat in a great chair supported by pillows the extreme beauty that had been so fatal to its possessor still remained though its lustre was gone emaciated and of a delicate fairness her hands and her face had a transparency that gave an idea of an unembodied spirit and her dress was such as favoured the deception the blood might almost be seen to circulate in her veins so plainly did they appear and her eyes had that dazzling radiance of ethereal fire to which the hectic heat of her glowing through wafted countenance still added a few locks of her fine light hair had escaped from her head-dress and played like broken rays from a receding planet round a face which only those who had hearts unhappily rigid could behold without feeling the sense of her errors suspended or overwhelmed by strong emotions of the tenderest pity 
She held out her hand to Celestina as she entered, and in a voice faint and uninterrupted from the difficulty with which she breathed, said, "'Ah, dearest madame, how good this is! How worthy that tender and sensible heart, of which I have heard so much!' She stopped, as if unable to speak more at that moment, and rested her head against the chair. Celestina, affected to tears, sat silently down near her. Cathcart left the room. After a short pause she recovered strength to say, "'But a moment will be allowed me, perhaps. Let me then hasten to thank you for this condescension, and to say how earnestly it is my hope that it will not be made in vain, but that it will afford me an opportunity of successfully pleading for another penitent, for poor Vassiver. "'I forgive him most willingly,' cried Celestina, "'and most sincerely wish him happy.' "'Ah, madame,' said Emily, "'you must then carry your generosity further, "'for you only can make him so. "'I dared to represent this in a letter to you. "'I now repeat it. "'Victim, as I am, even in the morning of my days, I should, however, die in peace, for I hope my peace is made with heaven. If I could see any prospect of Vassifer's being happy, reclaimed from that wild career which he is now wasting his time, his fortune, and his life, I owe him so many obligations. I know him to have so good a heart, that it is terrible to me to see him devoted as he is and plunging into an abyss of misery from whence it will soon be no longer in his power to return it has been a great consolation to me that i have had some little influence in stemming the progress of the evil but it is you only who can save him from himself effectually and how worthy would it be of goodness of compassion like yours celestina knew not what to answer to promise what she never could perform was little in her nature yet did she not love to check the disinterested hope that thus animated the soft heart of the fair pleader i believe said she after a short pause i believe you are mistaken and that i have no such power as you impute to me be assured that through Vassiver's conduct has been to me a source of the most poignant uneasiness i not only will forget it but shall rejoice in seeing him happy for his own sake and for the sake of that dear friend through whose means we first became acquainted a friend her voice trembled and she dared not attempt to name willoughby lest it should wholly fail her a friend who is still and who i dare believe will ever be truly attached to him and who on his return to england will i am sure use all the influence that friendship gives him over mr vassiver to recall him from a way of life you so much apprehend she was proceeding to evade as tenderly as she could the pathetic prayer she had just heard when emily was seized with one of those spasms which announced her approaching death celestina terrified called for miss elphinstone and unable to bear a scene in which she could be of no use she retired to another room where she passed with cathcart two melancholy hours at the end of which they heard that the fair unhappy emily was no more Vassiver, who was in another lodging at the Hotwells, no sooner heard of this sad event than the wildest frenzy possessed him, nor did his having so long expected it at all mitigate the blow. He ran to the house, and regardless of Cathcart and Mrs. Elphinstone, who would have opposed these frantic expressions of useless regret, he threw himself on his knees by the bedside, called to her as if she were still living was sure she should not die and now reproached heaven that she was dead from this state of temporary insanity 
nothing had the power to recall him till cathcart reproaching him very warmly for the impropriety of his conduct asked him whether it was thus he meant to promote the last wishes of his sister and obtain the pardon of miss dormeray that name had still all its influence on the heart of vassiver by a strange though perhaps not uncommon division of his affections at once vehemently loved the woman he had lost and the woman he hoped to gain starting from his knees he asked where celestina was for cathcart had not yet told him of her arrival and had promised to prevent his distressing her miss de moray is below sir but you must not go to her no go to her who shall prevent it was his answer and he hastily went downstairs when he entered the room where celestina sat weeping with miss elphinstone he had every appearance of a man out of his senses but at the sight of her he seemed subdued in a moment and while she dreaded some wild and frantic speech he threw himself on his knees before her and burst into tears his convulsive sobs as he eagerly caught her hands and pressed them to his heart and the broken voice in which he attempted to speak disarmed her at once of all the resentment which she had till then felt for his unwarrantable behavior when they last met and so tenderly in a voice of such soothing pity did she speak to him that he soon became reasonable thanked her for her generous attention even blessing her and calling her the restorer of his reason while celestina availed herself of this disposition of mine to prevail on him to retire which he did on her promise that she would see him again the next day after a mournful night of which more was passed in comforting and consoling mrs elphinstone than in sleep the day arrived on which celestina was not only bound by the promise which in the agitation of mind she was in the night before she had made to vassiver to see him but induced to declare to him again how totally he was mistaken in supposing her engaged to montague thoroughgood again he cherished the hope which she never meant to revive and at once to do what he knew would gratify her while he acquitted himself of the promise he had given to his regretted emily that he had a deed drawn up and executed by which he gave to mrs elphinstone and her children two hundred a year and settled them at the house he had in devonshire on the moment of her departure he gave this deed to celestina beseeching her not to open it until her arrival at Cheltenham. and whither you are going mr vassiver said celestina who felt her pity revive for him now that she saw him so dejected and subdued ah replied he i am careless whither i cannot however go back to my staffordshire house in the state of mind that i am now for i should infallibly hang myself i believe i shall go to london for even at this time of year a wretched dog such as i am may find somebody or other to help them to rid of themselves and the gaming houses are always open the gaming houses said celestina a eh, replied he i have been there always of late when i have been cursed miserable and play has a momentary effect on me in making me forget other things perhaps in wandering about london i may meet with some unsettled unhappy fellow like myself who may like to go abroad for six or eight months we may go find willoughby perhaps and my return may be the more welcome to you if i bring you an account of him alas thought celestina what account of him can i now hear with pleasure unless indeed that he is well 
that i always wish to hear and i think added she her heart swelling as she said it i think i should sincerely rejoice to hear that in his new situation he is happy with his wife vassiver again feeling the renewal of that hope which had almost escaped him saw celestina depart with more calmness than he expected cathcart saw her safe in the protection of lady horotia at chetnam and then returned to bristol to perform the last sad offices to his lost emily vassiver at his and mrs elphinstone's request leaving the place before her remains were consigned to their early grave the scenes which during this period passed in the family of lord castlenorth were most turbulent and to some of the parties equally melancholy the anxious peer whose health was as usual a little amended by change of country waited at paris the promised arrival of willoughby with extreme impatience impatience which had such an effect upon his feeble frame that death which had so long been laying in wait for him now seized him and at a period when the blow saved him from knowing what could not have been concealed from him many hours lady castlenorth having enacted with great dignity all that a mournful recollect must do on such an occasion and miss fitzhaman having also performed her part admirably the will was opened in due form of which lady castlenorth thought herself perfectly sure of the contents and she had indeed secured to herself a great deal of money and a splendid income besides her settlement the property descended to miss fitzhaman immediately was about eight thousand a year but in a cosido made in the immediate pleasure he received when willoughby first declared himself resolved to marry his cousin he had given him an estate of five and twenty hundred a year and ten thousand pounds in money as a nuptial present without however affixing any conditions to the gift the short ceremony of reading the will being over another was to be gone through less easy to miss fitzhaman which was announcing to her mother her actual marriage with captain cavanagh which she thought must otherwise be revealed by somebody else the dialogue was short but decisive miss fitzhaman or rather mrs cavanagh had more courage than tenderness and having now nothing to fear from her mother's influence with her father and secure of her fortune both at present and in reversion she attempted rather an air of triumph than of contrition lady castlenorth would be but fairly described by the strongest of those representations that have been given of an enraged woman when she has been compared to a tigress robbed of her young cavanagh had possessed the art to make her believe that his admiration of her mental perfections was the foundation of that attachment he felt for her yet that while he adored her beautiful mind her fine person was an object of tender admiration to find that he cared for neither the one nor the other but had availed himself of her credulity to obtain a footing in the family and money to get his matrimonial fetters broken that he might marry her daughter were convictions so extremely mortifying to her pride that they for a while suspended the power of expressing her rage when however that power returned she raved like a lunatic gave way to the most extravagant sallies of passion and though her lord was yet unburied protested that the same house should no longer hold her and her pelican daughter mrs cavanagh was more calm and retired to her room where mrs calder at length persuaded lady castlenorth to let her stay till after the remains of her father were sent forward to england which they were in a few days and then mrs cavanagh set out 
by the way of ruin to england also with her husband who was impatient to take possession of his great acquisitions the price of so much patient perfidy though he would willingly have been excused giving to willoughby even the small share of the ample property which his uncle had assigned to him yet he knew he must see the will and finally obtain it he thought it better therefore to continue with him the appearance of honour and therefore wrote to him informing him of lord castlenorth's death of his own marriage and the cosidal in favour of mr willoughby but not knowing whither to direct this letter for willoughby had left no intimation of the route he meant to pursue when he quitted paris he addressed it to alvanstone where with one on the same business from lady castlenorth it lay while willoughby was wandering among the pyrene mountains and while he pursued his impatient way towards england end of volume four chapter twelve recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume four chapter thirteen of celestina this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c celestina by charlotte turner smith volume four chapter thirteen unconscious of the good that awaited him and dreading the evil that might be irreparable willoughby landed at brighthelmston from dieppe though it was eleven o'clock when he got on shore he ordered post-horses to be instantly ready and used the moment he waited for them to take a slight refreshment on the table of the room he was in a newspaper lay it was long since he had seen an english newspaper and he took it up where the first article that struck him was an account of the funeral of lord castlenorth after his having lain in state at the house in town willoughby felt an immediate impression of concern for his uncle and feared least disappointment should have hastened his death on himself or any advantage he might derive from the event he never bestowed a thought but as the mind under the influence of any predominant passion returns immediately to his bias however temporarily diverted from it it almost instantly occurred to him that if his uncle had been so long dead without his knowing it celestina might possibly have been as long married trembling he looked among the marriages but there were no names there at all resembling those which he dreaded to see united his chase was ready and he departed for london for it was there only that he was likely to gain intelligence of lady horatia howard and he knew of no other clue to guide him to celestina celestina had left chantingham with her friend and was now at exmouth where montague thoroughgood was continually with them whether he was present or absent celestina was equally pensive and melancholy but it was only in the latter case that she attempted to indulge the sensations in the solitary walks which the sea shore afforded her for she avoided as much as possible being quite alone with him because her heart every day confirmed her in the opinion that she never could love another man as she loved willoughby and it was distressing to her to be frequently under the necessity of repeating what it inflicted such pain on her impassioned and indefatigable lover to hear it was now late september the evenings too shut in and when there happened not to be a supply of new books lady horatia often engaged montague thoroughgood at a piquet when celestina sat by them at work or 
if she could be sure he was so occupied as not to be able to follow her she walked out alone and as the moon trembled on the waves recollected the nights when with willoughby and matilda in the early days of their innocent friendship they used to mark and admire together this beautiful appearance of the sea illuminated by the moon here on this very spot she had with him beheld it the waves had now the same trembling brilliancy the surrounding objects were the same but willoughby was changed and happiness and celestina were she thought parted for ever such were her contemplations one evening when towards the end of the month and of lady horatia's intended stay at the place she left the company who were assembled at the lodgings and who happened to be the elder mr thoroughgood his wife their son montague and mr and mrs bettison who being on a visit to the elder mr thoroughgood when he was ordered to the sea for his health had accompanied him all together to exmouth and were shown every attention by lady horatia as the relations of her favourite montague they were at cards and celestina who never played took the opportunity of her admirers being engaged at whist table from which she knew he could not immediately escape to go out the wind was high and the sea boisterous it was growing dark and she fancied a particular gloom hung over every object still however it was luxury to her to be alone she was particularly wearied by the conversation of mr thoroughgood and found nothing in that of mr bettison to make her amends bettison was ignorant insipidly itself and time instead of adding to the number of his ideas seemed to have rendered him if possible more stupid amid such society she could derive no pleasure from the conversation of mr thoroughgood and lady horatia and the unusual weight she felt on her spirits seemed lessened when she could sigh at liberty and hear nothing around her but the wind or the sea breaking against the shore she had not however been out long before the chill and gloomy appearance increased and darkness coming on she slowly and reluctantly returned to the house she heard a little before she quitted the road horses behind her but not attending to them she did not even distinguish whether they were the horses of the people of the place or those of travellers she entered the parlour and sat down by the card-table where montague thoroughgood having performed his evening's task had just resigned his place to mr benson suddenly a voice was heard in the passage inquiring for lady horatia howard of the servant my lady is within sir replied the man and who are with her mr and mrs thoroughgood and the servant was going on when the inquirer said vehemently it is enough let me however see them celestina at the first sound of the voice had started from her chair the second sentence it uttered affected her still more but she had no time to answer the eager inquiry of montague thoroughgood what is the matter before the parlour door opened and pale breathless with an expression to which only the pencil can do justice she saw before her the figure of willoughby there was agony and desperation in his looks he gasped he would have spoken but he could not the company all rose in silence lady horatia who hardly knew him even by sight looked at celestina for an explanation which she was unable to give at length willoughby as if by an effort of passionate frenzy approached celestina and said in a hurried and articulate way i would speak to you madam though to this gentleman i suppose and he turned to montague thoroughgood i must apply for permission his manner his look as wildly he cast his eyes around and saw all the family of the thoroughgoods assembled which confirmed his idea of her being married contributed to overwhelm celestina 
with terror and amazement she no more doubted of his marriage with this cousin than he did of hers and could not conjecture why he came or why he looked so little in his senses she sat down for her limbs refused to support her and faintly said or rather tried to say i hope i see mr willoughby well lady horotia then addressed herself to him desired him to take a chair and to do her the honour of staying supper with her he heard or heeded her not but with fixed eyes gazing on celestina he struck his hands together and cried while the violence of his emotion choked him it is all over then i have lost her and have nothing to do here no by heaven i cannot bear it he then turned away and left the room as hastily as lie had entered it my dear celestina cried lady horotia what does all this mean do mr montague for mr moray is i see much alarmed do speak to mr willoughby i am really concerned to see him in such a situation no said celestina who would not for the world have had montague thoroughgood follow him no i will go myself after him her fears now gave her resolution and without heeding montague thoroughgood who would have prevented her she hurried after willoughby and overtook him just as he was quitting the house dear sir said she dear willoughby and those well-known sounds once so precious to him he turned around she took his hand i am very sorry to see you continued she in such agitations of spirits i greatly fear perhaps some misery between him and his supposed wife occurred to her i am afraid something is wrong wrong cried he wrong and do you celestina inhuman celestina insult me with such an inquiry wrong am i not the most cursed of human beings i hope not interrupted she for your happiness she knew no longer what she meant to say nor did he give her the time to recollect for eagerly riveting his eyes on her face and grasping her hands between his he cried my happiness and what of my happiness it is not gone lost for ever have you not destroyed it damnation and distraction why do i linger here he then plunged away and rushed out of the door where farnham waited with two post horses celestina trembling and attempting to stop him followed he tried however to mount his horse but could not he desisted leaned against it with his arm over the saddle and resting his head on his arms farnham spoke and celestina immediately recollected him what is the matter with your master farnham said she indeed he terrifies me to death oh ma'am replied the honest fellow sorrowfully my poor master come sir added he interrupted by a look of anguish and horror from willoughby come dear sir you cannot ride any farther i am persuaded to-night let me lead you to the inn willoughby without resistance suffered farnham to lead him a step or two but he waved with his hand for celestina to leave him and faintly said go go madame i wish you well i wish you well what is the way to the inn cried farnham not to the inn do not go to the inn claimed celestina you are very ill dear willoughby let us take care of you here lady horotia requests it farnham led him towards the door again he leaned upon him and sighed loudly and deeply at length he said i am a fool i came hither knowing all i know now and ought to have been better prepared for it but i am better let me then execute my last resolution and bid her one long one eternal adieu there was a little vacant parlour near the door there willoughby sat down the servants who were assembled brought candles 
celestina stood silently by the table on which they were placed and willoughby bid farnham leave the room a short silence ensued willoughby seemed to be ashamed of his weakness and trying to collect fortitude to bear like a man the cruelest moment he had ever passed he arose and approached celestina saying in a low grave and tremendous tone i have no right madame to distress you i have no just cause of complaint against you i am very miserable i deserve your pity your prayers i have been deceived you i hope will never have so much cause to regret it as i must have you i hope are happy will be happy he could say no more but put his hand on his heart and looked at celestina with eyes so ex of despair and grief that all the exquisite tenderness she had ever felt for him returned at once she forgot that he was as she believed the husband of miss fitzhaman but he was in a moment the beloved willoughby the first and only possessor of her heart she threw her arms around him and sobbing on his bosom became almost senseless from the violence and variety of emotions that overwhelmed her he shrunk however from her who is it said he gracious heaven that i thus hold in my arms not my celestina my own celestina but the wife of another go madame i entreat you leave me go or frenzy may overtake me and i may attempt impossibilities to tear you from your husband husband cried celestina i have no husband are you not married then not married to montague thoroughgood no indeed indeed i am not not married nor intending to be married neither indeed and you are at liberty then to be mine i am if you know that we ought to not be delighted those only who have loved like willoughby and who by a sudden transition are raised from the abyss of despair to the height of felicity can imagine what he felt at that moment if the fear of celestina being married had for a moment bereft him of reason the certainty of her being not only free but as passionately attached to him as ever had for a little time an equally violent effect amidst her own transports the extravagance of his terrified her there was a wildness in his joy which made her tremble for his intellects but after a moment her soft and melting voice the tender assurance she gave him that she loved only for him and that her heart had never been estranged from him soothed and subdued the tumult of his beating heart as his arms fondly encompassed her as he rested his head on her bosom he shed tears of tender gratitude his spirits became calmer and the native serene dignity of his mind returned he was not however quite tranquil enough to relate that night to celestina the extraordinary series of events which had led to the enchanting certainty he now possessed that she was not his sister but the daughter of lady horotia's brother that regretted brother to whose picture she had so great a resemblance the information however such as in his present agitated state he was able to give convinced her not only that the fatal supposition of her being too nearly related to willoughby was for ever removed but that she was born of parents to whom it was honourable to belong and that she was nearly allied by blood to her kind protectress she desired lady horotia might be acquainted with this not to-night said willoughby i would to-night see nobody but you my celestina hear no voice but yours to-morrow i will explain it all but now i feel my unexpected felicity too forcibly to be able to talk about it he could not however determine to quit celestina 
nor were either of them conscious of the course of time till lady horotia sent to let celestina know supper was ready and to beg the honour of mr willoughby's company it was then that celestina prevailed upon him to go from her promising to be ready to walk with him by the dawn of the next morning and you must go with me said he immediately to alvestone for i will not live another week without you he then recollected that alvestone might be sold for he had never heard from cathcart since he had given directions to have it disposed of he paused a moment and felt some uneasiness in the reflection but the happiness he possessed was too great to allow him to feel any concern long he smiled and added if indeed alvestone is still mine and if it is not my celestina will create for me a paradise wherever she is and wherever you are replied she whilst tears of tenderness filled her eyes celestina will find a paradise he then once more bade her good night again returned and again bade her adieu you are going now to rejoin the company said he and there is montague thoroughgood of whom i know is a weakness i do not love to think it is indeed willoughby a weakness unworthy of your generous heart and i hope what i can never have deserved that you should indulge well well my angel i will not indulge it but must you sup with them they will fatigue you with questions they will distress you by inquiries no i had determined to send an excuse for indeed my heart yet wondering at its unexpected felicity beats fearfully and my trembling nerves have unfitted me for conversation at length willoughby withdrew and celestina with a pencil told lady horotia who waited the event of this extraordinary interview in the most uneasy suspense that some extraordinary conversation with mr willoughby had agitated her so much that she could not return to the company but must retire to bed montague thoroughgood who was the most interested of the party had suffered all the tortures of anxious jealousy while celestina was absent every noise he heard in the passage every time the door opened he hoped she was coming she came not he went out not to listen but in hopes of meeting her he heard a low murmur of voices the tones were those of tenderness willoughby then was come to claim her he was forgiven and he himself had lost all hope he returned to the parlour pale and dejected his lips trembled his eyes were still eagerly turned to the door he heard nothing that was said to him but unable to remain in his seat again rose went out and returned at length he heard the door of the parlour open where willoughby and celestina were he listened attentively he heard her say good night dear willoughby willoughby seemed as he answered to kiss her hand poor thoroughgood could not bear it but became more restless again went to the door came back opened it to see if celestina was coming then helped the servant to put the chairs round the supper table without knowing what he was doing and sat down himself in one next to that which he had placed for her the supper was announced but no celestina appeared at length the servant brought in the note she had written lady horotia read it while poor montague anxiously followed her eyes she gave it to him across the table he ran over it and his solicitude becoming unsupportable he complained of being ill with a headache and desired permission to go to his lodgings the eyes of his father were turned mournfully towards him as he went out of the room mr thoroughgood however did not speak but he sighed and lady horotia understood him as for his wife though she had been extremely adverse to the thoughts of her son's marrying 
celestina while celestina seemed to be no more than a rejected dependent on the willoughby family yet now since lady horatia howard had adopted her she appeared to be altogether as fond of the connection so easily are minds like hers changed by adventurous circumstances and influenced by sounds the notice lady horatia took of her and her daughter betson delighted and elated her rendering her so distinguishedly civil that only the regard lady horatia felt for mr thoroughgood and montague would have induced her to support the awkward and offensive adulation of mrs thoroughgood the lady of the house was so anxious about celestina that only her general politeness or what is usually termed le usage de monde enabled her to acquit herself in the usual forms towards her guests the supper was short and dull the conversation being divided between captain Bettinson, who related a long story of a duel between jack marsham of his regiment and one of mr ebersley an ensign in the seventeenth the merits of which nobody understood and for the event of which nobody cared and mrs thoroughgood who described a dinner and a ball given at exeter the week before by a banker of that place on occasion of his daughter's marriage with the termination of these dissertations the supper ended and mr thoroughgood who had long been uneasy and impatient withdrew with his family lady horatia then hastened to the chamber of celestina she was just in bed but knowing who it was tapped at the door begged her to come in well my dear child said lady horatia and what is all this i am impatient to know and i madam impatient to relate though this evening i am quite unable to undertake it all the extraordinary circumstances recounted to me by willoughby you are then related to him no thank heaven i am not i thank heaven too that i am related to you to me celestina then gave a brief account of her birth and the way by which willoughby had learnt those particulars he had recounted lady horatia embraced her with tears of rapture every circumstance she recollected of her brother's visits to france confirmed the truth of willoughby's story and she very perfectly recollected the desponding state of mind in which he went to america after his last return from thence his imprisonment for a few weeks in the bastille which was imputed to some indiscretion and that he himself never otherwise explained exactly corresponded with what the count de bellegarde had related but while every concurrent testimony evinced the truth of that narrative lady horatia could not account for her brothers never having mentioned his marriage or his daughter perhaps however said she he might have reasons for this which i cannot penetrate my father was harsh obstinate and avaricious and always expected ormond would marry as his elder brother did to aggrandize his family this he used frequently to be teased to do but always refused and for some years his disposition retained nothing of his former vivacity but an ardour for war in which he seemed i often told him desirous rather of death than of promotion and he answered me more than once that i guessed right for that he was weary of life i own i not unfrequently suspected that some unfortunate attachment had so shaded his natural grey and vigorous mind with gloomy depression i have told him so and he has replied that whatever might have been the case he had no attachment then at length as celestina extremely needed repose lady horatia left her reflecting with infinite delight on the kindness she had shrewn her as an orphan and a stranger while she had in fact 
been protecting the daughter of her beloved brother with pleasure too now with pleasure too she now thought of willoughby since celestina's happiness was to be restored by her union with him but poor montague thurgood dejected and in despair relinquishing all those charming hopes which with more pity than prudence she had herself encouraged him to cherish presented himself to her imagination and greatly abated the satisfaction with which she thought of the approaching felicity of willoughby and her niece she determined however to mitigate as much as she could the force of this cruel blow and early the next morning while celestina was walking with the happy and enraptured willoughby she sent for the elder mr thoroughgood and related to him all she had learned from celestina the evening before i now blame myself my good friend said she for the part i have taken but who could foresee this yes i own i fear the consequences and heartily wish i had never given so many opportunities for to your son of contemplating those perfections of mind and person which he will never i fear be able to forget mr thoroughgood knew too well that this observation was just and dreaded lest the loss even of reason itself should be the consequence of celestina's marriage he returned home however immediately to relate to montague the probability there was that this event would immediately happen but however tenderly he communicated such fatal intelligence he found his son more affected by it that even his paternal fears had represented a silent and heavy dependence took possession of him he never complained of nor reproached any one but persisted in saying that he would fee celestina take a last leave of her and then try to reconcile himself to his fate but in his manner of saying this there was something more distressing to his father that he would have felt from the wildest ravings of despair he entreated him to relinquish his project of seeing celestina why should you see her montague said he to what purpose you own that while willoughby was in question you entertained no hope that celestina has never afforded you any since but that in spite of her assurances that you could never feel a second attachment that you have persevered and taken that hope which she refused to give you have no one therefore to blame and if you had sought pain you must learn to bear it but after all that has passed i cannot consent to your inflicting it on celestina or hazarding the possibility of giving uneasiness to her husband husband cried montague thoroughgood he is not her husband yet but if he were can my humble adoration offend him when i mean to bid her an everlasting adieu she will console my sick heart by tender pity she will bid me at be at peace and i may try then to obey her the sound of her voice is to me so soothing that if she does not refuse it i must hear it once more speak to me in accents of kindness mr thoroughgood finding everything he could say to dissuade montague from indulging this unhappy inclination quite ineffectual became extremely uneasy and dreaded lest some alarming consequence should arise from an interview which he thought willoughby could not approve even if it were reasonable or proper in his son to ask it but willoughby now perfectly secure of the affections of celestina was too generous and too noble-minded not to feel pity for his unfortunate rival his own happiness great as it was would have been more complete if he could have believed montague thoroughgood less unhappy would to heaven said he as he spoke of him to celestina would to heaven that he could see anzoletta 
and transfer to her that affection which while it is fixed on you can serve only to render him miserable celestina joined most cordially in this wish he deserves to be happy i believe said she and the desire you express to see him so is worthy of the heart of my willoughby but however liberal and reasonable willoughby was in regard to a competitor from whom though he had suffered much he had now nothing to fear he was not so patient under any circumstance that was likely to impede his union with celestina all that she or lady hirosha could urge him on the propriety and necessary of a short delay for preparations and forms he treated as ridiculous and so vehemently insisted on the necessity of fulfilling the promise he had made to the count de bellegarde at parting with him to return to him immediately with celestina as his wife that her opposition was to little purpose so totally engrossed however had willoughby been by his fears lest celestina might be lost to him that he did not even know whether he had a house to take her to but as with him all places were alike to her he sent an express that morning to cathcart informing him that he should be at exeter the next day with celestina desiring him to meet him there with jessie and to go with them to alvastone if alvastone was yet in his possession he dispatched another messenger to london for a special license to be married at alvastone or exeter and obviating every remaining circle he prevailed on celestina to set out with him that evening for the latter place with the consent of lady hiroshia who promised to follow them in a few days the distance was so short that though it was late in the day after willoughby's arrival at exmouth before this was determined upon they were at exeter by seven in the evening and in an hour afterwards cathcart and jessie arrived also cathcart not only informed willoughby that his estate was still his but put into hands those letters that brought the intelligence of that acquisition of fortune which came by the death of lord castlenorth the satisfaction of this intelligence the pleasure of meeting cathcart and jessie who were overwhelmed with joy to see them the certainty of returning together to a place they both so fondly loved seemed to complete the happiness of the long divided lovers early the next morning they reached elvenstone where in the absence of mr thoroughgood his curate joined the hands of willoughby and celestina above eighteen months after that period when they believed themselves separated for ever in three days lady hiroshia arrived at elvenstone and the additional pleasure her company gave them was checked only by the account she gave of the situation of montague thoroughgood who not having been allowed to see celestina the time of whose departure from exmouth had been industriously concealed from him had sunk into such a state of despondence as made his father tremble for his reason if not for his life for vassiver too whom willoughby had always loved he could not help feeling concern he knew not whether to direct him but from all the accounts he was able to gain he feared that all the good qualities of his heart and understanding were obscured if not destroyed by the dissolute style of life into which he had plunged with such avidity since their last parting he endeavoured however to counteract the impressions of these only alloys to supreme happiness by reflecting on the probable felicity of other friends and particularly of the count of bellegarde from whom ten days after his marriage he received a letter informing him that he was then going to perpagan empowered to release his wife from her convent and that they should go together with and their anseletta immediately to rochemart where he besought willoughby to rejoin him 
with celestina promising that if he would do so they would return with him and pass the winter all together in england though it was now late in the year and though celestina would have preferred remaining at alvanstone where she had fixed all her ideas of happiness yet the wishes of her uncle and the melancholy satisfaction of visiting the place where her mother had lived and where she died a victim to parental harshness and maternal grief together with the inclination willoughby shrewd to satisfy the count and introduce his wife to him and anzaletta determined her to make no objection to their immediate departure there was indeed no time to lose as the winter was so near lady hiroshia too who waited impatiently an interview with monsieur de bellegarde though she had no health to undertake such a journey hastened them as much as possible and in something less than a month after willoughby called celestina his he presented her at rochemart to her uncle de bellegarde to jacquelina and anseletta to the two former she appeared the precious representative of their two beloved and regretted friends the tender recollection of whom added to her own merit made her to them an object almost of adoration while anseletta loved her as a sister to whom she became more tenderly attached from taste and affection than even that near tie of blood alone could have attached her with what melancholy pleasure did the count tie round the neck of celestina that picture of her mother which her father as he was dying had taken from his own bosom with an injunction never to part with it but to his daughter and how many tears did celestina shed as leaning on the arm of willoughby he pointed out to her the spot where the count had shrewn him as the grave of genevieve willoughby kissed those tears away as they filled her eyes and bade her turn from the too frequent recollections of the past to those scenes of future happiness which love friendship and fortune seemed to be preparing for them in the romantic and magnificent scenes round the castle the poetical taste of celestina was highly gratified willoughby took her the spot where he had been lost in the fortunate night that everything led him to the residence of count of bellegarde they visited together the humble cottage of le laurier whose family they loaded with kindness and traced with her the scenes which were so many years before witnesses to the clandestine marriages of genevieve and jacquelina winter however put an end to those excursions in the mountains and the count de bellegarde having completed the settlement of his affairs agreed at the earnest request of willoughby and celestina to go with his wife and daughter to england on their journey thither they met a paris captain and mrs cavanagh they found the former became a man of the utmost importance and arrogantly enjoying the splendor of his new situation in a country where he had appeared in one so very different mrs cavanagh seemed to affect being happy and to disdain all she had relinquished to obtain that happiness her own way but for some strange caprice she now appeared so fond of willoughby that had celestina been liable to jealousy or had cavanagh really cared for his wife they might both in her manner have found sufficient cause of discontent mrs cavanagh related to willoughby all the artifices her mother had used to break off his marriage with celestina and when he expressed his wonder that lady castlenor should go such lengths in an affair in which her interest did not appear to be immediately or particularly concerned she answered in her usual sneering way if you could know my mother so well as i do but it is impossible by words to do her justice you would no longer wonder her scheme lay much deeper than you were aware of 
Lady Castlenorth tried to console herself for the defection of Captain Kavanagh, had taken, as her travelling companions, a young abbey, who, discontented with the prevailing politics of his country, found her at once an admirer of her person and character, and a strenuous supporter of his aristocratic principles, and, what was yet better than either, he found himself sharing a fortune beyond what he had ever dreamed of possessing. This well-assorted pair were at Brussels, and Mrs. Kavanagh diverted herself with some sarcastic remarks on the director chosen by her mother, of whom she always spoke with a degree of rancor which made Celestina tremble while willoughby shuddered to recollect how near he once was becoming the husband of one who could thus express herself towards her mother captain and mrs kavanagh were going to italy the happy party who took leave of them hastened to england where on their arrival in london lady horosha joined them and they were soon fixed at elvestone in such perfect felicity as is seldom enjoyed and still more rarely deserved the first inquiry of celestina was for mr thorogood and his family she learned that captain thorogood was the great friend and favourite of lady molyneux with whom he was gone to ireland to the displeasure of his father who had however no influence over him and whose disappointment in his eldest son was embittered by the condition into which a hopeless and incurable passion had thrown the youngest celestina who could not re reflect without great pain of the unhappiness with which the days of her excellent friend were thus overclouded took an early opportunity after her being settled at elvestone to desire an interview with the elder mr thorogood he came and she saw with redoubled concern the ravage which anxiety had made on his manly face and figure even in a few short months he related to her hardly refraining from tears the sad change that had happened in the temper and talents of his son i have sometimes thought said he that you my dear madam and you only can rouse him from these alienations of mind i was adverse to his seeing you before you went abroad but now i wish it your reason may reconcile him to his fate you pity soothe him or be the event of your meeting what it may no change can i think be for the worse celestina promised to see him and his father contrived with her the means of procuring this interview for montague now shunned everybody and very frequently would not appear even to his own family celestina did not however mean to meet him alone but to shrew him in anzaletta beauty understanding and sweetness with a heart untouched by any former passion and worthy of his her generous intentions succeeded montague thorogood struck with the resemblance between them and particularly with the voice of anzaletta was soon as passionately attached to her as a man could be who had once loved celestina herself the count of bellegarde who intended to bestow her with her ample fortune on an englishman and protestant hesitating not a moment in consenting to a union which would he found make his daughter happy and eight months after the marriage of willoughby and celestina anzalita gave her hand in the chapel of elvestone to montague thorogood willoughby had now but one wish unfulfilled for every pecuniary difficulty the multifiance of the count de bellegarde and the legacy of lord castlenorth had removed and this one wish was to see vassiver such as a reasonable being with every reasonable means of happiness in his power ought to be but in this as he had no second anzaletta to give him and should have feared his want of steadiness if he had 
he almost despaired of being gratified vasivir however sometimes visited at elvenstone and unlike montague thorogood he seemed to have conquered his extravagant passion for celestina since it was become hopeless he had unlucky for him taken up no permanent affection in its place but lost his health and his fortune in pursuits which could not afford him even a temporary possession of that happiness for which he still declared himself to be in search when celestina reflected on his kindness to mrs elphinstone and her children who now lived in comfort on the provision he had made for them and on many other generous and noble actions she could not but lament with willoughby that infelicity of which he continually complained even amid his wildest and most determined perseverance in the career of dissolute pleasure but for this source of regret as there seemed to be no remedy within her power she did not suffer it to embitter the satisfaction she derived from almost every other friend lady hirosha no longer complained of that tedium which at the beginning of their acquaintance seemed to have rendered life indifferent to her she had now in willoughby and his lovely wife objects of her affection and hoped to grow old amidst their children monsieur and madame de bellegarde were more accurately sensible of their present happiness from the poignancy of their past affections and their daughter the object of their tender solicitude made the felicity of a worthy man who deserved the affection she felt for him in cathcart and jessie celestina beheld the earliest objects of their beneficence enjoying all that affluence and mutual tenderness could bestow and the widowed heart of mrs elphinstone was at ease not only by her own present independence but from the assurances willoughby had given her of providing for her boys as soon as they were of age when they could be put to professions the elder mr thorogood too her venerable and respectable friend was restored to happiness in contemplating that of his son and above all celestina beheld in willoughby the best and most affectionate of husbands whose whole life was dedicated to the purpose of making her happy and whose only apprehension seemed to be that with all he could do he must fall indefinitely short of that degree of merit towards either heaven or earth which that fortunate being ought to possess who was blessed with so lovely and perfect a creature as celestina end of volume four chapter thirteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c end of celestina by charlotte turner smith